Well, dear participants, it's nice to see, by the way, that are, so many of you are, are here. Uh, that's very nice. Um, well, as president of the European Chemical Society, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to this webinar, Good Chemistry, Do Chemists Need Ethics? We have a very special speaker today, Dr. Jan Nelig, recipient of the 2020 UCAMS Award for Service, which is an award that acknowledges his innovation, creativity, and achievements, as well as his outstanding commitment in fostering chemistry and molecular sciences in Europe, which of course also includes his activities for UCAMS. Dr. Jan Melig is a science and technology ethicist with an educational background in chemistry. His academic interest lies in value co-creation processes and the role of scientists, engineers, designers, and other innovators in the discourse on sustainable scientific and technological progress. Jan is also the secretary of the UCAMS Working Party on Ethics in Chemistry, which contributes to and supports his work. We are very pleased to have Jan speak here today. As many of you know, UCAMS seeks to stimulate chemical education, which also comes with making students aware of ethical and societal issues that are connected to doing scientific research and chemistry research in particular. An excellent example in that respect is the e-learning course, Good Chemistry, Methodolo Methodological, Ethical and so Social Implications, developed by Jan, which is worth two ECTS credits and now available on the UCAMS Moodle platform. This course aims to provide students with a solid foundation in basic research methodology and allows them to understand, evaluate and assess contemporary ethical and social issues arising from scientific and technological activity and progress. I kindly invite you all to take a look at this course and consider recommending this to your students. I'm also happy to let you know that Jan has recently published a book by the same name to support chemistry students in their studies. The book is based on the lecture scripts of the course and provides additional materials such as case discussions and exercises. And I guess uh, the webinar today will be about similar topics. Um, uh, therefore, I will now hand over the floor to Jan. I very much look forward to your talk and the discussion that will, uh, will follow. Jan, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for this, uh, for this introduction. I'm, of course, very delighted to receive this honor of this uh, prestigious award. Um, this is a great honor for me, and it also shows from my perspective that the topic that I'm addressing here is, uh, well, ethics and chemistry, as it is often called, I prefer good chemistry, I will soon explain why, that this, kind, this topic really finds, uh, um, well, acceptance not only, but also there seems to be a big interest in addressing these questions, maybe thanks to a growing awareness for these ethical and social dimensions of chemical activity. And also, I mean, I believe I mostly talk to um, well, university chemists, as I like to call them, um, as I like to call you, perhaps, uh, that there is an educational dimension in it. That I was often addressed by chemistry students saying, these are questions that I often think about, but I don't really know how. I mean, this is my main motivation as a chemist and with an additional background in applied ethics to spend my education efforts in, in, in this direction. So, um, Professor Rutjes, you said many things about me already that I plan to, 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 to introduce myself uh, now. So I repeat some things. You said the basic things. I have an educational background in chemistry and applied ethics. Yeah, uh, I will now share my screen and uh, uh, show you my presentation, then it's easier for you to follow. Here we are. Okay. Um, I like to introduce myself also because I believe it directly has to do with the message I want to deliver to you today. Because there are often misunderstandings about what ethics is about. Um, first, my background. I'm, I was a chemistry student up to PhD level, I did research on surface patterning and a nanoscientific method of, of introducing um, 
molecules on monolayers of other molecules by chemical reactions on surfaces, and I studied the kinetics of these kind of reactions. Um, on top of that, because this was the, the end of the first decade of the 2000s, and nanosciences and nanotechnologies were widely discussed among many people, not only the scientists, but also in the general public, in regulation and, and policy making and so on. And we scientists often thought they are discussing science fiction, nanobots in the bloodstream or gray goose scenarios. And this is nothing what is really going on in, in the actual nanolabs. So where are the people who, who contribute the knowledge of what is really happening to those who discuss what should happen? There seems to be a gap. And I thought this is a topic for, for science and technology ethics, but I, I myself had no education in that. So I studied an additional master course, Applied Ethics, offered by my university in Münster. With this combination of, of ethics and chemistry, um, I got a job in the field of technology assessment at a renowned German uh, TA institution. Here I was working on an EU funded project, nanoparticles for early diagnosis of, of arthritis. And our work package, I mean, whoever of you works on an EU funded bigger project knows that there are these work packages on ethical, legal and social implications. And I was in this kind of work package and we were asked to, to extend our study a bit, not only for arthritis, but uh, in general nanoparticles in, in nanomedicine um, are there any ethical, legal, social implications that uh, we should take into consideration in the future development of this field? Here I worked with many different kinds of scientists and, and, and experts. There were the chemists, uh, nanoscientists, uh, they uh, develop proteins for coating nanoparticles. Uh, also industrial partners, Merck company was involved, biomedical research, hospitals in Berlin, regulators, so very different people coming together and discussing. And my perception was that the, the chemical and other, let's say natural science actors always said, you do your ethics, I have nothing to say about it. But as I said before, with this perception that in the discussion of nanosciences, uh, those who are concerned about social and ethical aspects discussed science fiction, I need these experts to tell me what is going on. Otherwise, my ethical considerations are somehow speculative. So I always try to, to find a way to show the, the scientific and technological experts that their input is extremely necessary for our discussion of social and ethical dimensions to be meaningful and have a, have a real constructive impact on the development process. So here you can see, hopefully, that this is the direction today's webinar will take. Yeah, I, I want to bridge this idea of, of ethics as moral philosophy to ethics as a kind of competence to bring a discourse forward. Um, I then left Europe to East Asia. I spent a long time in, in Taiwan as a postdoctoral fellow uh, with a project on uh, the ethical and social considerations in Taiwan's National Nanotechnology Initiative. Like many countries, also Taiwan invested a lot, and I wanted to see how are ethical and social dimensions addressed. In Europe, they are addressed quite much. Yeah, we have offices of technology assessment that, that spend a great effort on understanding the social impact of it. Um, in USA, for example, uh, to a, a, a lesser degree. And in, in Taiwan, I found, unfortunately, these considerations were not at all uh, on the agenda. For Taiwan, it was uh, mostly about international economic competitiveness. Um, later, as, a, as an assistant professor at a university in, in, in Taiwan, I studied value co-creation processes. And here, uh, I focused more on this idea again, what is the contribution of scientists, of researchers, of engineers with their technical knowledge to decision-making on innovation uh, processes. So that's what I call a normative discourse. Norm, I will go into detail soon. Norm means what should we do? What is the right thing to do? And the scientists and engineers, they, they can make decisions, but they are, this is not their main competence. So how can we make a bridge here? This is still my uh, 
main focus in my new job, which is started officially last Friday. That's why I'm back in Germany now at Bonn University with an ethicist, uh, Christiane Wopen, who is also currently the chairman of the European panel on ethics in science and technology in the new center for life ethics. And I'm very happy to, to have this new job and yeah, be back in Europe. So shortly I, I do normative innovation research. What can innovation do? How can we guide the process in the right way? This is of course uh, a kind of transdisciplinary field from, from many perspectives. Technology assessment does that so-called LC research. Again, those of you who work in EU funded projects often have these uh, work packages on these topics. Um, it's also a field from the social sciences, you know, STS, sometimes uh, this stands for science and technology studies. Uh, in, in, in other places, especially the Netherlands, uh, this often stands for science, technology and society. Uh, applied ethics has a lot to say, be it science ethics, technology ethics, bio and environmental ethics, but also business ethics. Um, a lot of input comes from philosophy and sociology of innovation, so to say the, the foundational, the groundwork of concepts. And um, another more practical field is, of course, innovation management. So this is, this is the field I'm coming from, and from which I look at chemical activity. So it could be that today is the, the, the only UCAMS webinar that will not show any chemical formula because I like to talk about chemistry from the well, procedural methodological perspective and looking at the impact of chemical activity on society and environment. Today's agenda, I first want to clarify what is meant by ethics in chemistry is sometimes misleading term. We need to define what the ethics is in applied contexts. And I also want to clarify what I mean with normative discourse and that it is a skill, uh, uh, almost like a hands-on skill, so say maybe mouth-on skill yeah, because it's mostly about uh, speaking out ideas. Responsible research and innovation is a framework concept often uh, employed in technology assessment to frame all these ideas of what is the impact of scientific and technological development on society and environment. What is the role of the different actors in it? For example, you as a chemist. And what is the meaning of interdisciplinarity in this context and multi-stakeholder discourses? Of course, and this is very important for me to point out, I'm not going to give you a theoretical lecture on these con on concepts. This can be read in some books, but it's often not really helpful because the, the target group for this is often sociologists, um, maybe also philosophers. But the important part is what is the role of chemists in this discourse? We need practical examples. This is the best way to show it. Um, I will give you, well, let's say two and a half, at least two where you will be active. Um, first is a nanopill project, a lab on a chip, uh, a very insightful uh, example from, from the Netherlands. And another one is, uh, uh, more or less a fictitious example, scientific policy advice on how to sequester carbon dioxide to tackle climate change. Um, just to give you examples of arenas where chemists input is necessary for a meaningful discussion of what shall we do. If during this presentation, you have a very urgent question, please feel free to type it in the question and answers section. I always keep one eye when I look not at the camera, it means I look at another screen and see what, what is happening there. If you have a question, I can address it right away. Um, bigger questions we can, of course, discuss after this presentation. Um, the first thing, though, I want to do is uh, activate uh, uh, you to participate. Yeah, I, I, because I said I prefer the term good chemistry rather than ethics in chemistry. So what is good chemistry? Of course, we can understand good here as an adjective. When is chemistry good? We keep in mind though that good can also be a noun. Yeah, the common good, for example, chemistry as a common good. Under what circumstances is chemistry a common good? What 
do chemists need to do so that it is uh, good? So the, I want you to brainstorm on this question. What, what is good, good chemistry? What comes to your mind? When, when is chemistry done well? Or what is a good chemist? Um, when you want to say something, I see, I see three hands already raised, but that's from much earlier. I'm not sure if that counts now. But if you have an idea, uh, please raise your hand. We will give you a chance to talk. And uh, for the sake of time, I, I would like to have at least five but at most five uh, um, uh, messages from you. What is good chemistry from your perspective? Uh -huh. Here's a, a message in the chat. I take that as one. Uh, chemistry, or let me translate that, that the, the output of chemistry that does not pollute. Okay, here we, we see uh, good chemistry as somehow impacting society. Good chemistry solves the problem. Okay, solves the problem. I understand it like this. Um, chemistry that elaborates knowledge that is useful for solving a problem. So in some sense, a, a good chemistry means it is methodologically sound, yeah, something like a, like a, 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 a valid, uh, scrutinized and still valid, a bit of knowledge that helps solving a problem. Ah, reproducible. Do I understand that correctly? Hopefully that this also refers to the methodology. And yeah, that is, uh, um, uh, well, yeah, valid knowledge. Devoted to have a better life quality. Um, here again, you address the, the, uh, the social dimension. Okay, there are more messages like this. Aha, uh -huh, here I see a keyword sustainability. A good chemist takes into account the societal implications. Aha, uh -huh, three R's. Okay, responsible, reliable, reproducible. That's a good idea. Good chemist uh, with skills, uh -huh. great and wide knowledge, creative. So here talk, we talk about the, the, the chemist itself rather than chemistry as an institution. Um, yeah, being skilled, of course, humanitarian purpose. I'm still looking for one very different example. Oh, very long message. Uh, please forgive me that now, aha, uh, uh -huh, research integrity. Okay, does not create new problems, yes. Okay, now forgive me that I, 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 stop, I stop here, even if, if I miss your message then. I believe that we could see basically three types of, um, three types of answers or three types of, uh, three types of directions of thinking what good chemistry is. L let me feed uh, this, this discussion with experiences I made also in other courses, in face-to-face -face classes, also in that online course, because I do the same uh, exercise there too. I always ask this question. Um, there is a first group of answers, something like good chemistry means advancement of knowledge. The chemist should be good at logic thinking, understand differences between description, explanation, and prediction or uh, chemical researcher knows how to apply scientific methodology for planning and conduct of experiments. So it's a good chemistry here, more from a methodological perspective, hands-on, a good researcher knowing everything about the own field, but also producing new valuable knowledge. Then there is a second uh, type of, of answer, and that refers to uh, the professionalism. Good chemist complies with codes of good scientific practice. Yeah, there are ways to do science well. Yeah, don't cheat, don't steal others' results, but also something like uh, scientific virtues. Uh, chemist is motivated by truthfulness and objectivity rather than fame or money. Yeah, we, we, we stress this concept of academic freedom, for example. Yeah, the scientific methodology should not be corrupted by dogma, by ideology. There are no questions sh that should be suppressed out of these motivations, out of non-scientific interests. Chemists always work in teams. They better communicate properly without bias and on, on the science yeah, and not on other aspects like yeah, money and fame and, and so on. So this is somehow the internal dimension of the overlap of chemistry and ethics. 
good scientific practice, research ethics, scientific integrity. There are many words of this for this. But then there is the third answer. And maybe thanks to my introduction today in other courses, this is far from, this is, you know, this is very different. Many of you answered on that external level, the connection be between chemistry and society. Chemistry is good when it makes processes and practices more sustainable. It's a common good, yeah? And that's why it cannot ignore the values that the society endorses. And because chemists have a special expertise, they can contribute to reducing risks that go along with chemical processes in industry and businesses. So he, here is a touching point between the chemistry as an institution or chemists as a community and the external fields, so economy, industry, but also regulation and policy making or even the general public. So these three fields somehow constitute the structure of the course that, that I offered and that I believe I was awarded this, uh, this uh, service award for. Uh, we have these three parts of, of something like science theory, um, scientific logic and reasoning yeah, as a foundation for what can count as good science. And then the internal dimension about uh, good scientific practice, also conflicts of interest, academic freedom, intellectual property. And maybe we can also uh, address something like animal experiments here. Chemists seldom do experiments on humans. That would be a special uh, topic for other fields. And then we have this external dimension. And today's webinar is only about this. So I know from, from classes that and seminars that, that I gave, there are, let's say, expectations on what ethics has to say about chemistry. Many chemists, especially university chemists, professors, expect that the only ethical dimension in chemical activity is the uh, scientific integrity part. What does it mean to do good science? Yeah? Not to cheat, not to copy from others, to avoid conflicts of interest and so on. And that's it. Beyond that, chemistry is somehow neutral and cannot be judged or evaluated in terms of societal impact. This is other people's fields. From my perspective, this is a big misunderstanding. And this is also the reason why I don't want to talk about ethics, because ethics often gives this idea of the, the moral finger. Like this is what you should do as a professional chemist, and here are other things that you should not do. And it is people that are usually non-chemists who tell chemists this. So the, in, there, there seems to be a kind of reluctance to, to, to accept this. And I want to show today that what I actually mean with all this good chemistry is nothing much about ethics. It is much more about, let's say, the willingness to think about values and normative implications. So what is the difference? Uh, first, before I go into this, I need to say something very important. I'm not sure about the structure of today's uh, attendees. Um, I believe most of you are from universities because UCAMS is an organization that where, where many uh, professors, academic chemists uh, uh, join. Also, maybe in very early stage of the career, uh, I joined as, as a PhD student, for example, maybe we have some here too. Um, at university, the perception is very different from, let's say, chemists in industry. But we need to keep in mind, even though we, we, we teach this at universities or we, we talk to chemists from universities, that the majority of, of uh, students with chemistry majors will not end up in academia, but in other fields. Of course, we find chemists in, in academia, at universities, at research institutes. Now, for example, yesterday's Nobel Prize in Chemistry for uh, one of them, Benjamin List, is from the Max Planck Institute. Um, we find some chemists in academic chemistry. A lot, and I admit that, a lot of what I say today is, does not apply to research in this field. If you do really very basic research, let's say your goal is to find a catalyst to bring in a cyclobutane for carbon atoms in a planar fashion, there, we don't need to discuss societal impact on this kind of research. This is so far from applications that it doesn't apply. But first, 
thing is that also at universities and other research institutes, we see a trend and we cannot ignore that towards much more applied research, where also universities have, and I mean, they do research projects with the clear purpose in mind, be it battery research, be it something renewable energy related, material related. So the topic of sustainable development goals and others is the topic also for university research. So it is far from being neutral. We must not mix up academic freedom with a neutrality of science. This is something completely different. Uh, academic freedom does not make academic research free from normative judgment and evaluation. Okay, then we have chemistry and industry. I'm not sure about exact numbers, but usually about say 80% of chemistry uh, um, um, uh, graduates go into companies in industry. Research and innovation, uh, or research and development, we say innovation teams are active here. When there's research uh, done, then usually with the clear purpose. We also talk here about production, storage, transport, yeah, marketing, sale, and application of chemicals. A third field that is often overlooked is public service. We need a lot of chemical competence and agencies and, for example, environmental protection agencies, ministries, political organs, patent offices. Also, big field is science consulting and scientific policy advice, because the world now is so complex that the, the regulators and legislators don't have the competence to judge uh, um, well, how impacting a development could be. So we need scientific experts. Um, also, those of you who, who, who work on, um, well, on research projects that are uh, at the intersection of, of, of technology and society that are very highly discussed, for example, energy, but also mobility, infrastructure, and so on, you might have become, you might have come into the situation where you had to talk to non-chemists, to a panel yeah, on for well decision making um, um, aid yeah, with your knowledge. So we can say what I talk about now is, is for those fields and not academic chemistry. But again, uh, it really depends on what kind of project you work on. So why do I avoid ethics? In the English uh, language, ethics can, has two meanings if we want to be precise. Ethics as a singular term means the philosophical discipline, the, maybe ethical theory, or more generally, the systematic attempt to find out what is good and right. Here it's about reasoning, about argumentation. Ethics as a plural term means morals. These are the rules and guidelines of a society. Yeah, so in, we can say in the scientific integrity part, research ethics, there's not much ethics needed because we know that stealing is wrong. We, we know that cheating is wrong. We, we know that uh, if we subscribe to certain rules, then it's right to, to, to obey these rules, to comply with these rules. So um, there is not much ethical discussion in that field. Whereas for that societal and environmental impact part, what is more important is the singular ethics term, the ethical reasoning and argumentation. But we have to be careful. Yeah? It does not need moral philosophers to discuss ethical questions, of course. Uh, we will see why. A term I often used and will use during this webinar is normativity. Normative means everything evaluative, like good or bad, right, wrong, desirable, undesirable, beneficial, harmful, and we can come up with more when we make a judgment that is not on facts. So the, the following is a very simple well, equation, you can say, it's a textbook example in applied ethics. When we make an argument what we should do, we always need at least two types of premises. We need the is premises, a situation. Smoking damages the lung. Th then we need norms. Health is important, yeah? we need to argue for this. So when we make a connection between these two, smoking damages the lung, but we need a lung for health, but we value health, that means we should not smoke. If we forget one of the premises, the argument is not valid. 
if we say smoking damages the lung, you should not smoke. This is called a naturalistic fallacy. You can argue, of course, I don't care much about my health. I want pleasure. I value pleasure over health. So I don't mind that it damages the lung. We can also, of course, question the facts. And this is where chemists feel more familiar. We talk about the, the is parts of arguments. We try to make uh, statements yeah, that, that are scrutinizable, that are checked, that is valid knowledge, as we pointed out before. So here, this can be present or future, yeah, scientific insights, but to make a decision on what we should do, we also need norms. Normative judgments can be values, virtues, maybe morals, but also laws, ethical claims. And the important part is that we make a connection between the two. They must be related. The logic must be consistent, must be plausible. There must be a kind of argumentative strategy. We don't want opinions um, and no biases and fallacies. And then we can make conclusions as orientations for actions, decisions, advices, recommendations, or arguments. Um, this is not to be understood as a kind of dichotomy between facts and norms, that there are some people are uh, elaborating on facts, others on norms. This can happen, but we can only make this inference if we put them together and discuss how they are related. This sounds maybe abstract. I will show you soon an example where it becomes clearer. First, I want to clarify an important part. Ethics is not a lens that focuses on the one right solution. Uh, I had students in classes that uh, at this point of a class would stand up and say, yeah, but ethics is all just random. Everyone has different conclusions. And um, uh, I'm unhappy with that because it means it is, it is not useful to think about it. This is because we expect with our scientific thinking that there is a kind of correct solution for a question. And it's often only one. Yeah, if there, if there are different opinions or different views, one must be wrong and maybe both are wrong and we find the right one in the middle, but there is the one right uh, solution where we can stop the discussion. This is not the case that we can find one right solution from ethical perspective. This may bother us, but from my perspective, the alternative is a better one. Uh, ethics understood as a prism. We have views. So an ethics looks at these views, analyzes them and reflects them into a spectrum of views and arguments. And then we can position ourselves and say, I find this view the most plausible. And based on this, we should conclude a course of action or an argument. The, uh, it, it bothers us because the discussion seems to be never finished, but it's not true that uh, ethics is kind of a random thing, something like an opinion. We use rationality, you know, plausibility analysis, argument uh, analysis, and so on to find valid statements. And then we find our position on that kind of spectrum of views. Uh, the last uh, theoretical slide. Another misunderstanding is that ethics has to do with theories. You know, we analyze problems with these theories. This, this is a mistaken view. There, there are two ways of how not to do ethics in an applied context. One is the moral philosophy top-down approach. Like we argue on what is the best way to look at ethics. You know, we, we analyze through concepts like duty and, and, and rights as deontologists, or we look at only the outcome, then we are consequentialists and so on. And philosophers spend time on discussing what is the best way. And then they, they, they analyze all cases in that one theory. This is usually not helpful. The other way, bottom up, means we take a case and look at that from maybe different ethical perspectives. And we do it for every case again and again and again. This is time consuming and doesn't lead far. Um, there's a middle way that seems to be more applicable. Maybe here's the point where I should mention the uh, applied ethics stand, is related to moral philosophy in maybe the way that chemical engineering is related to, to chemical science. Now we, we say we, we, we don't want to do the theoretical work that someone else did that. And often this results in something like ethical principles that are handy and that we know enough about to use them. Autonomy, freedom, 
uh, I also put sustainability here as some kind of uh, framework of ethical discussion. So we don't need to do the theory again. We have that done already. So when we take the theories and cases together, look through the principles we call principalism. And this is what's actually happening when, when we analyze scientific and technological progress. There is a discourse with different stakeholders looking at these principles and uh, making the connection between the options that we have to choose from in scientific or technological development and the outcome. This is really happening. You might not always noticing, uh, notice this. Yeah? Maybe you wrote a grant application and said your research is good for something. Maybe um, you wrote the introduction for a paper. And you will also try to, to tell the people first, why is this research meaningful? This kind of statement is often not a scientific one like the rest of the paper or the rest of the grant proposal. You need to make a judgment of what is the right thing to do. I did this research because I have a goal. I want to solve a problem. And I believe this problem is meaningful. This becomes more important and let's say bigger, more meaningful in corporate innovation. There are different stakeholders, the management, the CEOs, maybe the CFO or the finance department, and they, they all have something to say about what is a useful innovation for the company. And one stakeholder is the scientific expert that knows about, well, the scientific facts concerning a possible innovation, what is possible. And this needs to be brought together with all these other views to see what is the right thing to do, how shall we proceed? And of course, even more so in policy relevant science. What is the role of chemists in this? Yeah, originally we would frame that as a risk assessment. Traditionally, and if I want to say a time scale for this, let's say until 1980s, early 90s, the only reason we, we ask scientists to contribute to, 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 let's say innovation processes is usually a kind of risk assessment. What can go wrong and how can we limit that to to uh, the least damage possible. Um, this is very technical. Yeah? We can make formulas of concentrations and, and, and impact and so on. Uh, but soon we realized this might not be enough. Yeah? Companies uh, gave themselves environment health and safety standards, the famous EHS standards. But here we are still in that field of risk perception as the main assessment of uh, well, innovation. Then came that idea that it's actually better to, to ask for public acceptance, yeah? especially with the rise of, the, of, of biotechnology and nanotechnology in the 90s. It was clear that a, a simple risk assessment is not enough. Yeah, the risk assessments for, for example, uh, gene modified props, it, it was done a lot excessively. Still, the public was not convinced and opposed it. And this is something we cannot ignore in the environment, uh, I mean, in the um, development of a, of a technology, especially one that is so, let's say, science rich. Yeah, from, from, from basic science to the application is a rather short way here. The same for nanosciences, that public acceptance can only be addressed when we look at ethical, legal, and social implications. Now, at the end of the 90s, also this, well, let's say, a boom for, um, uh, the sustainability discussion, yeah, that sustainability is not only environment, economy, and society. There, um, there are questions that are that have an ethical and a legal dimension that we never really tackled before in technology development. Let's say it was left developing, and then we assess the impact, and then. At the end of the 90s, there was this turn of idea, we need to accompany the process. So we don't look at the, at the implications when they happen, but we try to assess before what is happening. So, and then we have a chance to guide this development in the right direction. Yeah, it's a form of societal embedding. The technology is good when it grows in the society and not somewhere outside and is then inflicted on it. For this, we develop technology foresight and technology assessment tools. So, of course, this is much more complex than the original risk assessment. 
It does not mean that now this task is delegated from scientific experts to others. And this, for this, I have an example for you now where you can clearly see that. Uh, so I can stop talking and make you think a bit more about it. Let me briefly introduce a very interesting project that also shows that what I'm talking about is not for a realm outside of, of academic chemistry, but where academic chemists are involved. And this is the nanopill, a lab on a chip for the detection of colon cancer, uh, because there's a demand, not, it was developed in the Netherlands, but not only there is a demand for a nationwide colon cancer screening as the third most often uh, form of cancer. The idea was that we have a, a lab on a chip, a pill that is swallows, takes a sample of bowel fluid, detects cancer-specific molecules. I will quickly show you this um, uh, as an illustration. That's better than, so here you can see the video, hopefully. Uh, let me start it. So here is the lab on a chip. The patient swallows that, it travels down the, the uh, digestive tracts through the stomach into the uh, bowels. Here, through a small hole on the, on the top, it takes the, the, the bowel fluid, there's a sampling intake, and colon cancer is indicated by specific DNA strands that indicates the cancer. So what happens first, all these, these, these molecules are filtered on an array that is coated with nanoparticles. And those molecules, no, first, of course, it filters out a lot of dirt. But what is, what is kept in this array are these DNA strands that indicate the colon cancer. Then they are released upon a trigger and travel over another array that has the complementary DNA strands. And once they bind, they change the resistance of this, uh, in this array. And this triggers a signal. When it's positive, when these DNA strands are found, then um, in this animation, it triggers an RFID signal to be sent. And the patient can receive the result on a receiver, maybe a smartphone. Okay, so this is, this is the, the, the illustration of the idea of the, um, um, of the researchers. It's very simple. Before that, for the screening, you, uh, the patient has to collect a stool sample from the toilet. And the idea is this is kind of medieval technique. It's dirty, it's humiliating. Uh, this is much simpler and it facilitates an efficient screening. So values here proposed in this project are health, dignity, efficiency, perhaps personal integrity, if you want. So uh, the, the animation shows the RFID signal. Uh, actually, there, were, there are two options. One is this RFID signal transmission to a receiver. Another one is that upon a positive detection of these DNA strands, uh, something makes a small capsule with a very strong blue dye burst and release into the bowels, and then it's visible later in the toilet. So my question to you, just imagine you are, you are in, this, in this project, and you are doing some work on, let's say, the chemistry of that whole thing. And you are, you are in this discussion on what shall we do? Which, which is the better option? How would you address this question? What would you opt for and, and why? I, I don't want a very scientific detailed answer. Of course, this is impossible. I, must be a coincidence if someone is really an expert on this right now. I just want you to briefly think, how, how would you think about this question? Why is one better than the other? What are the relevant factors for you? Uh -huh, here someone says, which, uh, which option is more safe for the patient? So you would think about, is the blue dye in some way harmful for the, for the bowels? Is it, is it uh, certainly non-toxic? If you want, you can also, of course, raise your hand and we give you permission to talk. If you don't want to type your solution. Aha, uh -huh, here, another technical answer. Which, which one is more robust, yeah? less false positives? Of course, that's how we scientists think about it. Here, I see a different answer because it obviously affects the, the patient's privacy. Yeah, the dye is only the patient can observe. Okay, a privacy uh, issue is there, yeah? So, 
if you have data on your smartphone, it's more easily shared with a large amount of people, then the question is, is that a good thing or not? Yeah, someone said, yeah, the, 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 the dye solution is, is private. Yeah, we, the doctor needs to rely on patient information. So is it good if the data can be shared? Okay, Professor Cole Hamilton, I will give you a chance to talk. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, Jan, thank you very much for your talk so far. So is the result as it arrives on the smartphone anonymous or can it be picked up by other phones? And the second thing is, if you get this positive result, what do you do with it? I mean, you may be extremely terrified by getting this result and you have no direct support from the practitioner. So is it, if you do the bowel sample, you are told by a doctor that you have this problem, you're invited to go and discuss it with them. What happens in this case? Okay, thank you, thank you for these questions. The, these are exactly the questions that the scientists have to discuss. Okay, now I say at this point, this project was accompanied by a group of LC researchers. And they found that these, the scientists actually asked these questions, but they don't think this is important. This can be decided later. For the design of the pill, yeah, if they said it's, 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 it's not our issue. Yeah? There will be a solution for questions like who will get the data. There will be someone deciding on, uh, on privacy. Yeah? Will this be a pill that is given to a patient at a doctor's office? So that it doesn't, I mean, this shocking result would, or diagnose would not come in private with a kind of uncertainty what I want to show, and I will explain it now, is that this, this very simple decision, well, not simple, but a, a very down to earth decision on two options for a research development uh, has very big implications that many scientists are not aware of. So many of you said, um, yeah, of course, we, we check which method is more reliable in terms of, of um, uh, false positives. We, we check uh, the, the components uh, concerning their toxicity, for example. But what happened, of course, was that um, when going to other stakeholders, they have a lot more to say about it. These LZ researchers, uh, with this knowledge from the lab, what, is, what are the options, went to doctors, patients, health insurances, pharmacies, also the possible producer, the mass producer of the pills, and so on. So, and, and, and they had, of course, uh, 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 concerns about, about privacy, what happens with the data if it is the RFID signal transmission. Uh, the, the, the manufacturer of it said, we prefer the blue dye solution because this will probably lead to uh, uh, um, higher well, sales or higher uh, um, a production number that is worth uh, um, uh, maintaining because people would take these maybe home and do it every three months. Whereas if it's RFID signal transmission, due to the data regulations in the, Nether in the Netherlands, it would have to be given out by the doctors and they would say it's enough if you do it once in three years. So the, the logic of the manufacturer is a different one, but the, the, um, the, the, the data regulations would not allow in the Netherlands at least that the data to the patient's smartphone is directly uh, uh, sent to a kind of server or a database in doctor's offices to accompany the process with, with direct advice. But this, this would be the only way to make it, to make it um, uh, well, efficient, efficient screening. On top of that, there were other problems that um, the, the idea of the scientists that it's simple is not uh, plausible because to make the pill work, the patient has to drink two to four liters of a laxative to clean the intestines before taking it. Most patients uh, trying this felt terrified by that. Some vomited and they said, I'd rather take a stool sample than take this pill. So, so this initial idea, this judgment of, of what is a good development was not thought through with all the relevant factors. Uh, and this, this decision, uh, in the end, they opted for the blue dye actually. Because, because mostly for legal reasons of, of data safety. For patients, it was actually not the best solution. Yeah, the, the, those patients who take it are usually 
um, elderly people, forgive me elderly people, but uh, many patients just felt very insecure with this. Is it is a bit blue enough? I'm not sure if I saw blue, maybe it was just a shade. So, so the patients were not really happy with this, with this solution. So, so um, I, I didn't follow this uh, recently. I'm not sure if this is now really a, an option on the market for cancer screening, um, but because many, many of the implications were not thought through by the scientists after all, uh, it, it could mean that the the, sign, uh, the, the, the project was in some sense a failure. Of, of course, for the, for, the, for the lab itself, it was a success. It was a big uh, progress in, in, in lab on a chip technology, many experiences made. But uh, I, I like this example because you, you can see that, that many decisions in, in, in labs, uh, chemistry labs, biology, but also in engineering and so on, many, many decisions, many factors are outside of the, of the radar, let's say, of the uh, scientific and engineering actor. I want to illustrate what, what happens in this discussion. Also, you, you said, for example, the, uh, we need to assess which, is, which has less false positives or which is more safe. Yeah? The, um, I want to show you this scheme of the International Risk Governance Council um, because it tells a lot. When talking about risks, scientists always feel happy with these two types of risk discourses. A simple risks where we say, for example, what is the concentration of, of, of uh, uh, an agent in a confined environment. Now, when we talk about food packaging, for example, yeah, there was this trend of coating the inside with nanoparticles to make the ketchup come out of the bottle smoothly. So then we can say, what, what is the release of, of particles into the ketchup? Is that safe? So we make a simple uh, 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 statistical risk analysis and then can maybe define a threshold and that's it. This can become much more complex, of course. If we talk about, let's say, uh, uh, compounds in an open environment, the pollution of, of a river nearby a lacquer factory, for example. So then there are different ways of checking it. And we need experts, for example, chemists, to discuss how to solve this problem. And if there is any type of conflict, it's between methods, for example. But that can be solved. And we, we can sit down and see what is the best way to do it. If there are too many uncertain factors, then instead of st statistical risk analysis, we do a probabilistic risk analysis. This is the realm of, 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 of chemists that they feel comfortable with. But there is much more to it. Risk balancing, risk modeling is necessary when we have a value, for example, autonomy, privacy, data safety, like in the NanoPill uh, project, and, and how does my development affect this? There's uncertainty. We might not know the, 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 the future development. And um, it's not possible to express this with a normal risk analysis. Here we need to, to, to point out the implications for that value and model the risk. This is a cognitive and evaluative type of conflict at the same time. Of course, there are safety aspects to it, but there is more than that. And it becomes really complex when two conflict, when two values are in conflict. Here we can frame this nanopill project as a risk because on the one side we have something like healthcare, yeah, efficient healthcare, efficient screening. On the other side, we have privacy. So what is more important? Why would patients uh, reject the efficient screening method and, and, and say, I, I don't want my data to be on a server. There, there are people like this. Uh, we, we can argue about it. We can convince the other side that one value is more important than the other. And here again, I want to point out there is a strong link between, of course, what is possible, what is the technical or the scientific solution, and that needs the input from the chemist, to answer the norm component. Now, the, the question is, how do we know about all these values? Of course, we have frameworks for that. Yeah, sustainability. Um, sustainability is usually defined as uh, um, a decision at the overlap of interests between environment, economy, and society. 
this is a just, just a definition that many perceive as not really helpful because interests, what is the interest of the environment? We can say that as humans, maybe di diversity, biodiversity, uh, the health of the ecosystem, yeah, the ability to recover, but um, it, it's difficult to compare that with other interests, for example, monetary interest, the profit interests of, of, of companies. So um, what I find more helpful is a redefinition of sustainability as value co-creation. We want to co-create value. Now, some might say science and engineering, we need to strictly separate that. Yeah, science is not engineering. Engineers, they want to create utility something like a function that was not there before or a function that is better than the previous one. Uh, so, but what utility does science create? Of course, we can say a kind of epistemic utility. Epistemic means knowledge related. Of course, a bit of knowledge that we create can be employed for something. So it, I believe that both science and engineering's goal is something like utility in one way or another. But we need to put this together with other ideas of what creates value, yeah, price, profit in economics. In psychology, maybe something like a satisfaction of a user. Society wants integrity in the widest sense. And ethics talks about value as norms. So and if we manage to, to, to foster a development that creates value in all these fields, then we can say that is sustainable. The, the important part here, and I will give you another example in a minute, the important part is that we need to coordinate between these value concepts. That means usually represented by different people, we need interdisciplinary discourse. And what that means, I want to give you another scenario and this is now something like a scientific policy advice. Again, I'm aware not all chemists will come into a situation like this. But you will soon see that this, the same principles apply for, let's say, corporate innovations, even research teams, where you have the, to make a choice between different options and want to find out which one is the best option. So here, the, my scenario is the political panel seeks counsel regarding options for sequestering carbon dioxide as a response to climate change. I refer here to a taxonomy by Robert Pielke in a book I, I mentioned uh, on the slide there. So um, again, please take some time to think about it. If you are on this panel, because you are an expert on sequestering carbon dioxide, how would you, let's say the day before, prepare your presentation? You have 10 minutes to talk there in this panel. What will you tell them to answer the question? I don't, if you, if you share it now, please, please do not um, go into scientific detail here. Yeah, it's not about like how profound your answer is, just in principle, what, what are the, the, um, the important things you need to tell them about sequestering carbon dioxide? in principle. If you ever talked to a, to a panel that is not chemists, maybe not even scientific experts, uh, you might have thought about this already. Like how, how, do, how do you introduce something that is important and meaningful to you, to people that you expect will not understand the science? You mentioned some factors yeah, to, to the urgency, time stability, safety, capacity of method versus the amount of carbon dioxide released, okay? But for a follow-up question for Miriam, uh, does, does that mean you need to explain the methods and let's say show the, 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 the equations and everything to illustrate why one is better than the other? Provide alternatives, okay. Okay, in, in view of the time, because I want you to ask questions, of course, um, I, I just show you this, this taxonomy. So what, what could happen? Okay, I, I see some of the questions in the question and answer section, uh, okay. David Cole Hamilton, uh, you, you're right. Will it be stable over long term? Where will it be? And so on. So, of course, you, you address this question in your presentation. So what can happen? There's the first presentation that looks about like this. That's all the science of sequestering carbon dioxide. No, not this slide. This uh, picture is just an image. Yeah? But uh, it, for the people on the panel, it will look like this. Uh, if you give something like a science class, you introduce all the chemistry of sequestering carbon dioxide, of different methods, of its efficiency, and so on. But you yourself stay 
neutral and say, I'm not the one to decide. This is all the knowledge I have because I'm the knowledge expert. Uh, Pierke calls this the pure knowledge exponent. It's like a science class, all the background, but neutral. This seems to be not too helpful, of course, for the, for the panel, because what shall they do with this knowledge? They are still not any further. The second one is a type of presenter that says, here I have the solution to all your problems. Here's all the science of this one solution, and I advise you to do exactly that. This is kind of the opposite of the pure knowledge exponent. Pilke calls it an advocate, like a booth at the science convention, saying, I present all details of the one best option, so that it means this researcher made a choice and promotes that. Uh, there can be conflicts, of course, because what the, the, the problem that this advocate identifies is not the exact problem that the panel has. There's the third type that sounds somehow better. I present this kind of image because this has to be elaborated in a kind of roundtable uh, discussion. And this is a kind of arbiter. Imagine like a hotel concierge saying, okay, sir, what would you like? Then they say, we want the economically most feasible solution. And then the scientist says, okay, in that case, here is a good solution for you because it is the cheapest. If the panel had said, we want one that has the least side effects on the, on the flora and fauna in the oceans, they say, okay, then don't do the, the, the uh, phytoplankton a uh, uh, method or whatever method there is that say that because this has other side effects, even though it's the cheapest. So depending on the value, the panel says is the most important, the arbiter can offer different solutions. This sounds better because it's more flexible, but Pierke identifies an even better type. He calls the honest broker. This is not a mistake, it's the same photo. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe a bad choice here, um, but, the honest broker is more like a career fair. The honest broker will question the panel's decisions on the values. Say, okay, you ask me to find the cheapest solution, but you have to take into account that this might not be the most environmentally friendly. So you will have a drawback. You have higher costs later to, to deal with the adverse effects. And then the panel has to rethink again. So this means the scientist here with the knowledge about efficiency without the impact and so on can, can, can uh, stir a constructive discourse and question the original value statements. This would be ideal. So how, how does this help as an orientation for planning your, your contribution to such panels? Uh, I, I give you a non-chemical example because it makes it clearer from my perspective. Imagine you have a friend who has a depression your best friend. How will you help the friend? You will, as a pure knowledge exponent, uh, lecture about psychology of depression and medical indications and everything. What is a depression? Will your friend be helped? Probably not. The advocate will just say, I know the one right thing to do when you're depressed, go camping in the mountains, you have fresh air, but maybe that's not your friend's thing. Maybe it is, maybe not. As an arbiter, you would ask the preference, you know, do, which, which kind of uh, solution do you expect? You know, is, is, is therapy a solution, but that took, takes a long time? Do you want maybe a fast one? And then, and then offer help. The honest broker will, but will then question this preference. You know, if, if, if you just want to go camping in the mountain because, because you think that helps, I don't think so. Maybe you need to talk to someone professional because after all, that can cure your depression more sustainably. So now we do this maybe for a chemical example. Um, you can do that for yourself. I, I, I just, I will briefly introduce a possible solution here. When, when you work in a company, uh, let's say paint producing company. And as a chemical expert, you are asked to, to find a solution for the safety equipment on a chemical factory site. Yeah, maybe with innovative sensor technologies and so on. So how would you present this to the executive board to make a decision on that? Yeah, as, as a chemist, you can of course collect all the available sensor and detection technologies, list their pros and cons, prices and features and how they work. Um, but this is not, is, um, let's say the help for the executive board to make a decision is limited. 
Um, you can by yourself, of course, decide what is the right thing, cheapest solution, and then you design a plan and say, this is what you need to do. But there's a high chance that the executive board is not happy with that too. Uh, you can, of course, talk to the, all the relevant stakeholders in that company, stakeholders, not shareholders, stakeholders, and then, and then design a strategy according to their demands. But ideally, of course, with the chemical knowledge that you have, you will, you will question certain uh, uh, um, uh, parameters and values and guide a constructive discussion on this topic. So the, the important part here is that you do not need to leave your chemical competence to contribute to ethically and socially relevant discussions. So after all this, uh, after these examples, we can ask again, do chemists need ethics now? Now I can say, no, chemists don't need ethics. Innovation processes and decisions informed by experts need competent normative judgments. Yeah, this is not much about moral philosophy, ethics, but uh, about values and their priori priori prioritization. Sorry. Um, experts are different people, but amongst others, of course, also chemists. And many chemists work in such innovation contexts, yeah, ranging from basic research to applied research to corporate innovation. Here, interdisciplinary discourses take place. Um, this is happening. Yeah? I once heard chemists said on questions of dual use, uh, we are left alone. I don't think that is the case. There are many ways in big research projects, but of course in corporate innovation, it, it always, uh, there are different people discussing what's the best thing to do from different perspectives. So what is needed is the competence of, of discourse and making a connection between the factual knowledge and norms and values. If that works, and there's a good cooperation with different actors, then we have a, a much better chance of competent normative judgments. So chemists need ethics? No, chemists need awareness of normative implications of their work and the competence to address these in professional discourses. Ethics needs chemists. And I really mean that because I tried to, to assess ethical implications of chemical progress and chemists said, I have nothing to say about it. But if you don't have anything to say about it, what can I assess? It is really crucial to make this connection between facts and norms so that this, this working towards sustainable development is really efficient and works. So I want to close with this to see again that, that facts and norms are not two separate things. They might be if we look at university disciplines that natural scientists and engineers elaborate on facts and social scientists and philosophers work on norms. But this is not the point. The point is that we can only make conclusions on what we should do if we make a logic connection between what is and what ought. And for this, we need chemists willing and competent in participating in the discourse on technological development. Okay. I think basically that's what I wanted to say. I'm almost 10 minutes over my planning, but um, I believe we still have a lot of time to discuss and ask questions. I see one that I want to address now. Um, um, I click answer live. Yeah, I don't want to... Um, I want to address uh, Duccio Di Prima's question. Now, what is the difference between integrity and norm? Um, a norm is, in, 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 in my definition here, um, I believe that's a common one. Norm just refers to, to uh, yeah, how to say, normative questions. Uh, it can be ethics, can be law, can be morals. Um, integrity is one of those norms because um, let's say integrity is a desirable state. Yeah, in, in, integrity, this is a too broad a concept. Personal integrity means you, 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 you stay intact, so to say. Ethical integrity means your actions are in accordance with your value commitments. 
Yeah, in, in this kind of this kind of well, from Asian perspective, harmony aspect, of course, um, uh, is chosen as a norm because it could be otherwise. Yeah, norm is a category. Integrity is a concept. I hope that answers the question. Okay, I thank you for joining. Okay, I give David the chance to talk. Thank you very much, Jan, for a very interesting talk. I, I do have a, a slight problem with okay. this normative. It's not, it's not any problem, it's just that if you say to someone, no, you've got to make normative judgments, I don't think anybody will understand what you're talking about. Really? No. Okay. Um, it means anything to me, except when I hear you talk about it and you've defined it here as values, virtues, morals, laws, interests. Ethical thing. Okay, okay. Um, I, I, I actually, I, I have a, uh, I had a slide that I actually kicked out of this presentation today that might explain it a bit. If we make, if we make um, statements, and statement is very general now, if I say the whale is a fish, then 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 you will you will say no, it's not, and we can argue why it's not. I say it's in the ocean, it swims, it's a fish, of course, and you will say no, that doesn't that's not how it works. Uh, 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 look look at maybe evolutionary pathways. So then then we have a factual discussion. In principle, I like to say we we can go to the library to solve our issue, and we will find the right book, and then I have to admit, oh yeah, I was wrong. This is, these are factual statements. On the other side, I can, make, I can make evaluative statements. And here we have to differentiate further. I can say black cars are the best. And you say, no, red cars are better. This is in the realm of preferences and opinions. There is no way to discuss about it. Yeah, we, we can both be right. Maybe there is not even any way to say who is right or wrong. So it's a meaningless discussion. Ethics is not this kind of evaluative statement, but one where we can, we can employ rationality and argumentation to figure out who's right or wrong. If I say um, uh, the danger of, of personalized medicine is a huge amount of data that gives too much information about a patient that is too tricky for everybody involved. Uh, and, and you say, no, that healthcare um, is only efficient and we can heal diseases when we have a huge amount of data. So how can we solve it? This can be solved. This is different from the car question, but it is also different from the whale question because that one is factual. We cannot solve this issue by going to the library alone. We have to make, um, 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 well, we, we have to make, um, no, we have to base our argument on some kind of starting point. And this is where all the trouble starts. Is this maybe something religious, God, for example? Is this uh, ancient Greek philosophy or something? So there, there's always something where we need to, to, to accept that we start from a kind of argumentative basis. But once we do, we can employ rationality and make logic conclusions. And this, these are normative statements. These are, uh, they, they are um, based on some kind of norm. Where that comes from is an open question. And that's why we always keep discussing on this. But once we have it, it is possible to, to, to do this. Um, does this answer your question sufficiently? That, that normative here means something like a, like, a, like a value preference, but one that is rational and not intuitive or emotional or out of personal opinion. And I, I understand that, but, but the point I'm making is not that. The point I'm making is what if I say to someone, no, you don't have to be ethical, you don't have to use ethics, you have to use normative judgments, I don't think they would understand what I meant by that, because the word itself is not in common use in, in, uh, in English, as far as I'm aware, whereas... This is, this is very important uh, to point out, yeah, because same like, for example, chemists uh, uh, use some kind of jargon yeah. Uh, in communication that, of course, I use mine too in, 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 in my field. Um, I use that so much since 10 years that I think, well, normative is such is a normal adjective. 
um, it's, it's good to know that it's not. Yeah? And, and that's why I actually try to spend time also in, in this course, uh, I mean, in the online course, to, to explain what is normative. And this is actually everything that is not factual and not only opinion. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think the, yeah. So, so when you came to the last slide, you said, do, eth do chemists have to be ethical? No. You said, oh, that's 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 a different question. This is very interesting. That's what you do, actually said. Do, do, do chemists need ethics? Okay. Yeah? And, and then I say no, no, because we don't expect, uh, let's say, chemical experts in their role of experts. Yeah, not as in in, in any other uh, human role, let's say. Yeah, but as chemists, their main competence is contributing uh, the the let's say chemical facts and relate them to norms that are at stake. This is different from do they need ethics? No, the chemists are not in the position to judge that. This is an interdisciplinary activity that the different contributors do together, but it only works when the chemists contribute their part. So what, that's why this sounds so complicated, yeah? but, 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 but ethics is not one of the competences chemists need. I'm not going to teach chemists ethics. Uh, but what I want to teach is the competence, first the, the competence to see, to make a relation between the chemical knowledge that the chemist elaborates and values that are at stake. But not, ethics would mean to judge these values. Yeah, but I think if you said to chemists, no, you don't need ethics, then they would go away and say, okay, well, I can do what I like and, and it doesn't matter what happens. Which was clearly isn't what you're saying at all. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's why I differentiated the internal domain. Yeah, I mean, do chemists need to be ethical? Yeah, of course, yeah. because that's a matter of, of professionalism. This is the way we do our daily work. Of course, there is some kind of ethical code, and I strongly promote that. Yeah, I would even say we need something like an Hippocratic oath for, for, for impacting scientists like chemists call it a Baconian oath or something. They were saying, I'm, I'm always willing to do my work to the best of my knowledge and conscience. That means an ethical chemist. But do chemists need ethics? Yeah, in the sense of something like, a, like, like, like a, a, a professional ethics, I mean, philosophical discipline, competence. I would say no, because that would, we would ask way too much. But clearly chemistry has an impact on society and environment, and it needs those who know about this impact to team up, so to say, interdisciplinarily with those who have the competence to make judgments on, on, on ethical and social aspects. Yeah? The social scientists can say, German people value privacy over, over uh, uh, freedom or safety over whatever. Yeah? Then th these are factual statements too. But of course, in, 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 in very complex matters that have uh, in, uh, uh, aspects of justice and fairness for society and uh, um, renewable energy development, for example, um, mobility questions and so on. There are, of course, clear connections between, between the progress itself, the innovation, sometimes even obvious artifacts and how it impacts the life world of the people. And that's where I think it, it needs all stakeholders to come together and discuss it. And if the chemists say, I did my work, now you do yours, from my perspective, this, uh, this doesn't work. No, thank you. I suppose what I, what I would suggest is the word responsible might be better than normative, that's all. Okay. Okay, uh, there are no other hand signs. Let me try to see if there are more qu uh, questions in the chat. Ethics behind the scenes. Um, do you mean with behind the scenes something like a common sense? Or you mean behind the scenes, other people clarify the ethical part first, and then the chemist can step step up and uh, and inform the decision making process. I mean, this is what's actually 
happening in many situations when it comes to these LZ research groups, scientific policy advice, and so on. Uh, uh, of course, first, we collect all the input from different aspects, among them often ethicists, and then we make the connection. But that would be, there is a danger of multidisciplinary. Like what we saw in like 20 years ago when there are statements from, let's say, a government, but also many books about the social impact of nanotechnology, for example, there is that chapter from, from, a, from a nanoscientist and then a chapter from a social scientist, and they're not much related. This is multidisciplinary. This was not helpful. We need interdisciplinary. That means they too have to, they can only do their contribution when they know the other person's contribution. Only then it is effective. This was um, very much exercised in the um, uh, uh, elaboration of REACH, the, the chemical registry. There was very clear collaboration between chemists, between legal experts, even between social experts, economic experts, because only when they work together, they know what is demand, what is necessary, what could be a useful structure and so on. No one of them alone could do that. Um, is it implied that chemists will always be in consulting role? No, of course not. Yet many of the social questions of the relevant questions, even now we know that in pandemic uh, situation, of course, uh, but also in, in, in energy related questions, medical and healthcare questions and so on. Uh, they are so science rich. I mean, they need expertise. So I see it as a good development that more and more governments and uh, legislative organs consult experts on questions. I mean, this is, for, I think, what we need. Right? We don't want dogmatism and ideology. We want very pragmatic uh, decision making. I would just like to ask you whether you still want to take one or two questions or because uh, apparently it's very nice to see that there are mm -hmm. no, I'm, I'm, I'm scanning the the, the 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 chat if I see more questions um someone likes the term normative okay Jessica Fermier asked the question yes of course you 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 can if you have questions contact me oh my last slide uh, quickly You'll find my email address, but I believe it's also possible to communicate via the UCAMS website, I believe. It's my email on the webinar page. I'm not sure. Here you can see it. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think so, Jan, but we can edit if that's fine with you. Uh, okay. I, think, I think Laura already sent in the chat to everybody link to the online training course on good chemistry, which you have mm -hmm. on uh, our website. Uh, so that's surely a possibility to reach out to you there uh, as well. Okay, I find two more questions. I think that I want to answer here in the uh, question and answer uh, is norm from German language. Uh, norm could be something that is agreed upon to be standard. Yeah, th this is that's what I mean with this is the never ending discussion. Where do norms come from? Uh, law is a norm, but I mean, laws are also in some sense agreed upon. We don't have any natural laws. Um, uh, spiritual and religious people often refer law to something like a religious manifest, like the Bible. Um, in, in philosophy, uh, even this decision, do we look at outcome like consequentialists or do we look at duties and rights like the deontologists, like Immanuel Kant? I mean, they, they have all their reasons why they start from somewhere, but after all, it is a matter of, let's say, zeitgeist, yeah, the spirit of the time, how we think about the question. We cannot, and this is a danger in modern times, that we are so science and technology oriented that we think there are scientific ways to define norms, yeah, something like a kind of evolutionary ethics or even something like we look at the biology of human to see what, what, what are the endorsed values. I find that very dangerous. I'd rather leave it open to say we, as a constructivist, so to say, we construct norms, but once they are in place and socially accepted, they are the norms. So yeah, it's something that is agreed upon. Uh, if we are strictly scientific analytic, we feel uneasy with this, but on the other side, we don't want norm systems to be rigid and, and, and then becomes, it becomes dogmatic. 
uh, would you say good chemistry is always on the side of greater good for greater population? Um, this is a very difficult question. I mean, uh, good chemistry, as I try to point out, has many facets. Good chemistry is it means to to be a good scientist uh, in the in the procedural way. It also means to stick to a form of um, professionalism. The main concept that I did not go into detail in theory here is like responsibility, of course. Good chemistry means to be responsible. What is a chemist responsible for? It can, of course, sometimes mean um, to, to oppose majority views. Um, it, it can mean to step up against certain developments and trends. Yeah, it is, of course, always on the side of greater good, but what that is, um, is, is not written in stone anywhere. Yeah, I mean, that's the point. So it, 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 it can go against the majority of population in some sense and still be good chemistry. Uh, of course, there are some critical topics like uh, the contribution of chemical expertise to the development of chemical weapons, where there's a direct call on, on, on chemists to rethink the purpose of their research and maybe step up like, uh, uh, what's his given name? Gaston. Who, who, who developed the precursors for uh, uh, Agent Orange and uh, the other agents that were used. Uh, he, he, when he realized what happened to his research, research stepped up like an activist and say, this, this is not what we do research for. So uh, where can chemists do this? Uh, this, this is of course, um, uh, you need to be very aware and maybe that's all that it's about awareness for these implications and not necessarily studying ethics and become experts on it. This is less. Uh, now more interesting questions come up. Uh, uh, do, do I have the time? Well, I think we can still take a few of them if, you, if that's fine with you. Mm -hmm. The ratio between facts and norms is sometimes unbalanced. In, in, in which way? Because my, my I mean, I would, I would think that very often our discussions are too factual. We, 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 we stick too much to, to scientific facts. Um, I was very happy to see, for example, in the discussion on the pandemic uh, related restrictions in Germany, that among these experts that are asked and, and taken serious are many uh, social scientists and, and, and ethicists, because we cannot make a proper decision on lockdowns just based on, on virological facts. That um, we, we, need, we need to address questions of fairness and, and, and the relation and uh, uh, um, the, the impact of such decision making. And I saw that in Germany. Uh, I'm not sure about other countries. Uh, another example coming to my mind is the radioactive waste disposal site identification in the UK, where, where there is a lot about the safety of the, uh, of the sites and so on. But, but this is not what solves the question. But there were many good um, uh, well, strategies to identify such sites also based on societal acceptance. Um, but the problems occur from my perspective rather than we don't have enough norm discussion. Uh, um, do you think number of rules should be proportional to the relevance of the facts? No, no I think the number of rules should be proportional to the to the to the let's say the the degree of impact of a decision. I mean, if 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 it's something that that um, relates to everyone, like renewable energy strategies, um, including research on batteries, for example, then um, we we need to see the, the the impact of of what is at stake. And if that is big, the the ties between the technical technical and scientific development and the social and ethical discussion should be stronger but not more rules i don't think that is that 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 should happen but i mean that's also what i see from my perspective that there are more and more institutions that team up with the scientists to to make a constructive uh, technological progress possible Oh yeah, it means, uh, good chemistry means to play fair in research and academic environment. Yeah, this is the internal domain. This is something like research integrity that uh, I fully agree. But um, 
since everyone almost agrees, I didn't want to make this part of today's webinar because we all know this. I, I often heard this from students also of this online course. I, talking about not stealing, not faking data. And so we, we heard that so many times. And, and hearing that again does not stop those who want to do it from doing it often. Yeah, there, is, there, is, uh, there are studies on this and ethics courses don't make or don't reduce scientific fraud. But what it can reduce, no, what it can increase is this awareness of social impact and the willingness to participate in its discourse and provide the competence to do so. And that's why I think this is such an interesting part and students confirm that. That with, uh, once you, you think through it, for example, Pielke's taxonomy, how do we talk to other people? How do we make our contribution meaningful? What, what is sustainability and how can I apply this to my work? Is a sustainable chemist one who replaces a toxic chemical with a non-toxic one? From my perspective, this is thought way too short because what is sustainability as value co-creation, we need to see in a, we need, we need to think in a much larger picture. And with a bit of training, I think that is possible. It's not asked too much from chemists. Yeah, Jan, I would now like to thank you very much on behalf of, of EU camps for uh, this uh, lecture on chemistry without any single chemical formula, as you mentioned, uh, some mm -hmm. during your talk, which doesn't uh, happen uh, usually. Uh, and it triggered a lot of questions. Uh, I'm pretty sure also a lot of thoughts. Uh, and it will uh, continue, as you say, it's a never ending uh, discussion. Um, so uh, thanks a lot, uh, uh, indeed. Uh, thank you also to Laura for uh, coordinating uh, this event and uh, to Anna for uh, helping out with uh, other technical issues, as well as, of course, all the participants uh, for joining and for all your uh, interesting questions. Uh, so thanks a lot and um, hopefully see you on another occasion soon. And thank you for providing the panel here and uh, thanks everyone for participation and for asking questions. And uh, if you, if you feel like, feel free to write an email uh, with more questions. I'm always happy to, to maintain a connection uh, uh, with all kinds of chemists around the world and, and uh, discuss these kind of questions.